Well, I hope you've had a blessed Christmas and a blessed New Year and are looking forward to it. Do I have at least a couple of shaking heads? Yes. All right. (laughs) Well, we've put another year behind us, too. Or have we really put another year behind us? I've preached a sermon or two over the years on the futility of of resolutions, of New Year's resolutions, and I, you know, for maybe a fraction of a second, I thought about doing that again, but I'm not going to. (laughs) Uh, I I can't even remember the first time I got up and started saying, have you made your your, your New Year's resolutions yet? And then preached a sermon about, you know, trying to uh, do what, you know, uh, predict what God's going to do, and you never, how, how often do we follow it, right? Not very often. Well, this morning, I want to start by saying too often we look back on the year and too often we don't see things as being better. Or maybe just a little progress, but what? I'm still the same, right? Just like the Israelites were at this time in Isaiah. You know, they were, you know, wondering, did things really get better for us? Yeah, maybe a little bit God was there, but things didn't, you know, things were kind of bad. And too often, when we're in that position, what do we do? We start questioning God, don't we? Which leads too often to our not believing that He is really sovereign and He's really there for us. And then what happens? We start drifting a little bit. And sometimes that drifting goes from a little bit to a lot. And we drift from the one God, one Savior, and one Lord, who we say in the morning, yes, we believe in, but by night we've abandoned, or maybe not completely abandoned, but but stopped believing completely. In Isaiah, God is showing both his judgment on sin and disobedience, but he's also showing his grace and mercy. Why? Because Israel is his people, and we together are his people. And especially here in Isaiah, God doesn't speak just to the immediate situation, but speaks to all those chosen by him throughout history, and now to us today, today, this morning right here on January 1st, 2023. God asked in Isaiah, as all the prophets do, where is your faith? Why have you left God for the idols of the world? Why are you drifting even when you saw me, when you see me, when you've heard me? through my caring for you and restoring you from your sin and your disobedience. Is this just ancient history? What about us? What about us, you and me, and the year behind us and the year ahead of us? What about a good, bad, indifferent Sad, joyful, depressed, anxious, full of blessings, ready to give up, giving thanks for so many things. What about this one? Wondering why things haven't turned out the way I thought they would. Going about our life as if there's no real purpose or real meaning to it. We're so absorbed in our hectic lives trying to do better and better, trying to be more faithful and faithful, and yet we don't remember who we really are. And you combine all those kinds of questions, both positive and negative, with all the comforts that we have. And we ask, or we should be asking, what's really going on? What's really going on between our heart and our mind? We're really looking for meaning and purpose, 
right? We're really looking for the purpose of our living day to day. And we live, though, in a day where meaning and purpose are sought in ourselves. I, I am most important, and I define who I am instead of the one true and living God. And that's what's going on here in Isaiah. And just like the Israelites, what do we do? We meld together all the ways of the world with the good things that God has given us to where we can't tell the difference. We can't tell the difference anymore between idolatry and who God really is and why we really are serving him. And just to emphasize the points even more, a few days ago, the national census was released for England and Wales. And why England and Wales, you say? Well, it just happened to be the most recent national census released. And it's sad because for the first time, for the first time in the recorded history of the census in England and Wales, the proportion of people who said they were at least nominally Christian has dropped below 50%. It's 46%. And 37% this year, which was a huge increase, said they had no identified religion at all. And if you remember your history, Rich is going to start talking about Christian history, England, at least nominally, has nominally been Christian for thousands of years. In the, in the 2022 State of Theology survey for Ligonier Ministries, 60% of evangelicals, and, he, and the way and Ligonier defines evangelicals in a very um, point-by-point orthodox way, and you self-identify as one or not, 60% said that God accepts the worship of all religions. All religions. Over 50% of evangelicals said that God learns and adapts to our circumstances. Okay? Over 60% of evangelicals say the Holy Spirit is a force and not a personal being. Okay? And then this one. Almost 70% of evangelicals say that everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. And that goes to the core. That one alone, I, I have to stop myself here in just about 30 seconds or else I'll preach a whole sermon on that one. And that one alone goes to 2,000 years of Christian teaching and controversies and what we have often thought as settled doctrine. And yet this is 2022. And these, every one of these answers, I just picked the category of self-identified evangelicals, forgetting the overall survey. What's happening here? What's going on? Acceptance in some way of the world to where being an evangelical has very little or no meaning anymore. Um, It's like Paul in Galatians 1 where he says, after just a few years of establishing churches in Galatia, he says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And the answers to these four four answers alone, not counting the other 25 or so, by evangelicals is serious heresy to claim what is claimed. 
And as, as we move away from the teaching of God's moral law, we become more and more like the world around us, just as God warned over and again to the Israelites, unless they turn back to him and to his word. His word, written and spoken. Well, let's look at the first two sections I read, verses 1 to 7 and 10 to 12, and then we'll look at the verses 18 to 20 long, along with a scattering of the rest of the chapter. Isaiah prophesies around 700 years before Christ, and yet he is as relevant today as he was to the Jews and the Israelites of his time. We have Christ in the writings of the apostles and the other writers of what we now call the New Testament. But because of that, because we have all this extra writing in the New Testament, we have even less excuse for our idolatry, our moving away from the Word of God. We have even less excuse for our lack of witness and our lack of faithful obedience. That is now too often the norm in the church. And that's what frightens me. Just like the prophets, we don't even really see ourselves as moving away from the Word of God to melding with the world around us in what we believe and teach and see. The last chapter, the last verse of chapter 42 pronounces God's judgment on, on Israel when Isaiah says, so he, that is God, poured out on him, the Israelites, the heat of his anger and the might of his battle. It set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. God speaks to Israel not as some obscure nation, but as his very own child. As his very own child. And yet they don't take it to heart. So Isaiah ends chapter 42 with these words of judgment and then begins verse 1 of 43 with the word but. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. There's so much here in just those few words. Isaiah uses the very name of God here, Lord. And for some of you, I'm repeating something that you say I've known forever, but for others, Maybe not. He uses the word, the very name of God, Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Every time you see that in your Bible, that's the personal name of God. In Hebrew, we say Yahweh. We transliterate that into the English Y-H-W-H. And I don't very often in sermons talk about the Greek and the Hebrew specifically, but if you've ever want to know a Hebrew word that you should have up here all the time, this one word, along with a couple others, Yahweh, remember that word when you see it in, the, in your Bibles, both the New and the Old Testaments. It's a powerful word. It's the personal name of God for, given to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 when he asked God, who should I tell the people is sending me? And God simply said what? I am. I am. Yahweh. It's the most holy name in all of Hebrew. Even to this day, Orthodox Jews don't say it out loud. My Hebrew professors, both my Hebrew professors in seminary didn't use it because it was so holy and revered. It describes the ultimate character of God. Holiness is like the giant umbrella of who God is and everything else falls under it. Revelation 4.8 has the angel saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who, is, who was and is and is to come. The only word you'll see in Hebrew, holiness, repeated three times in a sentence. And Isaiah is saying that if we don't see who God really is, then he just becomes a God created in what? My image. And not that I am created in the image of God. 
I'm created in God's image. God doesn't change and become different things to different people as the answers to the, uh, that one question believe. So Isaiah says here that the most holy God is he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Thirteen times in these ten chapters between Isaiah 40 and 49 does God and Isaiah use the double Jacob and Israel. And notice the contrast between the two. Who's Jacob? Jacob is the deceiver. Jacob is the one who, who deceived his father Isaac in order to take the rightful inheritance from his brother Esau. God created Jacob. Yes, he creates everyone unique. But then he created, he formed the people of Israel by changing Jacob's name to Israel. Nothing merited Jacob. Nothing merited Jacob being the father of Israel because he was a deceiver. He sinned greatly in order to get that inheritance. So God changes Jacob's name to Israel when Jacob contends with God and God blesses Jacob in, in, in Genesis chapter 32 in order to show that Israel is the newly created people of God, fulfilling the covenant that was made with Abraham. In fact, going clear back to the covenant in Genesis 3 that God made and said would happen. And the word create here also is significant in that it's the same exact word used in Genesis for God's soul creating power out of nothing, all that exists. And he's saying to the people of Israel, I created you out of nothing. I created you a special people. And I formed you into, this, into the people of God, my chosen people. Most especially man in God's image. God's saying that you, Israel, are the special creation of God. And he's looking clear back to Mount Sinai. And when he was on Mount Sinai, and as I mentioned, going clear back to Genesis as the chosen people of God. Now, the same words are being said to you and me this morning, every one of us. Do you believe, do you believe, and I'm, we don't have time for me to go around and say everybody's name, do you believe that you are a special creation of God himself? Do you believe that you're adopted by the living God as his heir? Do you believe that you are created by God for a specially ordained purpose? That's what God is saying to the people here. Before he says anything else, he's establishing who he is and what he's done as that God. God makes the point even stronger in verse 10 where he says, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. We are all witnesses and servants of the Lord God who has chosen us, the elect, so that you may know and believe and understand that I am the one, the creator. Know, believe, understand. Was John, the apostle John, thinking of this chapter and other chapters when he wrote at the end of his gospel, where he said, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. I wrote these things, John says, so that you would know and understand and believe. And God's saying to Israel and all of us in Christ that God will preserve those he has chosen because he's created us special. Well, God then continues to show his grace and his mercy by twice saying, fear not, in the first seven verses. Why? Fear not. You are not to fear because it is God who has redeemed and called you. How? By name. Wow. That's, 
That's hard sometimes. But he calls you and me, especially by name, long before the earth was created. And again, there's a whole bunch of verses and sermons in that. We'll just stick with what he says here. He's redeemed you and he's called you by name. Yes, God is alluding in these verses to the redeeming of the Israelites from their bondage and their slavery in Egypt. But the wording also says so much more that by emphasizing that the people had no way on their own to free themselves, they're lost without him. Our own efforts to free ourselves from the slavery to sin are as fruitless for us as they were for the Israelites. We can't do enough ourselves to free us from our sins, and the Israelites could never do enough to bring them back to God. It was all God. There's a long, long history of the grace of God and his dealing with Israel among all their idolatry and disobedience and moral failure, and even their being conquered just for who they are, the people of God. You see, the people of God, and this may be hard sometimes for us in our circumstances thousands of years later to to really grasp, but you see, the people of God will always be seen as an aberration by the world as we are increasingly seeing today. Yes, we're to be in the world, but we're not to be of the world as the scriptures teach. You see, we're now in what we call a post-Christian world. We're encountering a world that the apostles encountered in the first century of paganism and, and persecution. We're encountering a world of enemies like the Israelites did at the time of the prophets, including Isaiah. Enemies that God uses both to punish and to bring judgment, but also enemies that God keeps at bay to show that he's a faithful and loving God who redeems those who are truly saved, who protects and guards the remnant that still holds fast to the Word of God. Verse 3, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. (coughs) Excuse me. Verses 11 and 12, I, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed, you are my witnesses. I am God. Verses 14 and 15, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. I can save myself, I say, too often. Or I just need more faith or more prayer. I just need, a, you know, and fill in the blank to get right with God. I can make my salvation more secure by working to be more obedient. I say I'm saved by Jesus, and I hear that all the time. I say I'm saved by Jesus, and yet there is no change. There is no change of any kind in our daily walk. Many, many people say they are a Christian, and yet there is no evidence at all that they are a Christian, or really have any concept at all that it is God who actually redeems, which is reflected in the surveys I mentioned. We're called, we're regenerated, we're born again, we're justified, adopted as heirs, we believe and we repent. We are sanctified. We are sanctified day by day the exact same way the Israelites, through the constant cycle of obedience, sin, repentance, restoration, and then obedience, and God keeps peeling off the layers and brings us more and more and more into his presence and makes us more and more holy. Once saved, We repent of our sin daily, hourly, weekly, all the time as we are made more holy. I grieve, like many of you, 
over the sin that affects us in so many ways, even just the daily muck of life. I grieve over the price that God the Son paid so that we could have life eternal. I saw a quote this week um, when something like this, God who is absolutely holy made himself unholy so you and I could be holy. And that's sanctification, that's justification, that's all the doctrine we talk about. That's the personal making us more like him every day. We are witnesses to the power of the living God to carry out his plan of redemption through all the sin and the judgment of the world. It's the only way that we understand the grace and the love of God. He holds us tight. At the Exodus, God made a path through the sea. You remember the story? God brings the people out of Egypt. He brings on a path up to, the, up to the Red Sea, and what do they do? They start to panic when they see the Egyptians coming in the distance, miles away. They could see the dust, and they start to complain. And what does God do? He makes a path. He makes a path through the sea, and the Egyptians start to follow them through, and what's he do? He closes the ocean, closes the sea. And in the same way, he makes paths for us and clears the paths through our daily walk. What is in your path that keeps you from believing and causes you to unbelief? Or more likely doubt that drifts into unbelief at some point. The world out there is the world out there. And God protects and guides. I saw, uh, well, this week, uh, Carl Truman, who wrote the book we used last summer in the Reading Club, he uh, wrote a post this week about the complete rewriting of a word in the Cambridge English, the Cambridge English Dictionary. And it's one, of the le- it's one of the dictionaries in the world that is um, kind of the standard for, for definition of words. And the Cambridge English Dictionary has changed now the the meaning of what a woman is. Okay, take a look at each other. I mean, man and woman, right? Which is defined in the Cambridge Dictionary as an adult female human being. Is there any disagreement over that definition? Well, now here's the definition that is now officially part of the Cambridge English Dictionary. A woman is an adult who lives and identifies as female, though they, may, though they may have been said to have a different sex at birth. This undermines the whole of civilization since God created man and woman in Genesis 1 and 2. When we no longer define man and woman as man and woman or when we accept things like homosexuality of all types, and transgenderism is acceptable down to the very youngest. This is radical. It's radical heresy because so many Christians buy in to some of this. The very essence of a key word has changed and so undermines the moral foundations or begins to continue to erode the moral foundations of our Western world. This isn't just a discussion around a table of people with different views. This is being forced on all. Think of things like pronoun policies that many of you have already had to deal with, along with the one that's down the list now, (laughs) abortion, an entire generation has been lost to, to abortion and so many other heinous sins. What happens when there is no longer the norm of a creator where the common grace of the creator keeps us 
with some moral underpinnings. Well, go to the first chap- 11 chapters of Genesis to see what happens when sin runs completely to its logical conclusions. And granted, Moses only has a very few short chapters there from really from Genesis chapter 3 when man falls into sin till that first thousand or so years to where sin has completely taken over. And there's only what? One man and one family left out of thousands, millions. We must confront the fact that God is already bringing judgment as he has done before as we see in Isaiah here in 43 and other chapters and the Old Testament and through the centuries where there's only a small remnant who remain to teach what we call the whole counsel of God, his word. God says to the Israelites, Remember who you are. That I redeemed you and made you my own. You are my witnesses. God speaks both judgment and grace, blessing and curse. So how do we deal with all this? Well, for those who are really saved, the chosen, God says in verse 18, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. God in verses 16 and 17 has asked the people to remember what he did in the Exodus and at other times. But what he's saying here is while God's past acts of deliverance are to be remembered, we have them recorded and we're supposed to look at them, he says, don't dwell on them. Because God, you know, they're thinking God's not doing anything to the day, so they look backwards, not seeing what he's doing right now including right now today. God wants the Israelites and us to see that he's not just faithful in the past, that this is is just a great story of God's faithfulness, but it is what is God doing right now, right here among us, the people of God, to preserve those he has chosen through our obedience to the word of God. Romans 8.28, we know, Paul says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, those who are called, those who love God, those who are saved, those who are chosen, Israel, we say it, God says it, but where does it go? Verses 19 to 21, God says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I have formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. God says, Behold, A new thing, a new thing I, your God, Savior, and Lord am doing. Don't you perceive it? Don't you perceive it? That he's going to make the way through all the desert and the wilderness of life. He will. All creation will honor him. And the immediate application is God's talking to the remnant who's going to be returned from Babylon where they thought there was no hope left, back to Jerusalem where the Messiah and the Savior will come. See, God's looking forward. The people have to go back because this is where Christ is going to come. Look at the words in verses 20 and 21 again. God gives drink to my chosen people, the people whom I created, I form for myself, that they might declare my praise. He says this even though the people have rebelled and sinned. Again, he says in verses 20 to 24, all about that. But then he says in verse 25, 
I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake, and I will remember not your sins. I blot out your transgressions for whose sake? For God's sake. And I will not remember your sins. That's justification. That's the transformation. God taking our sin on the cross and at resurrection we get his blessing, his righteousness. It's given to us. And he hears and he doesn't see our, our sin anymore. God then says to the Israelites to remember him and to converse together and uphold his word so that God has proved right. Try to prove me wrong, he says, but, but you can't do it. Do all your arguments, but I'm God, I'm he, I'm your redeemer, your savior. I've often asked or I've often said that it's okay to question and ask God why, and it is. But what happens too often is it becomes idolatry and pride when we go beyond the why to demanding from God. And then we fall into sin and disobedience and we fall away from God. Doesn't always happen, but it can happen. We have to watch ourselves. Too often we feel that God's let us down. And we could spend probably the rest of the day talking about that one. But God says, that's trusting in yourselves. And not in God's faithfulness. God says he gives us drink the water of life to his chosen people, so that what? We can declare his praise, that he's led us through the path, the saving path. We take communion in just a little bit, just a few minutes, to remind us of what God has done and to declare that he is with us right now, right here, this morning, the Holy Spirit's with us. And yes, life can be hard. Life is a challenge. And if sin affects us in so many different ways. And yet water is a symbol of life and God gives life and we praise him. First Catechism says, what's God's chief purpose? What? To glorify God. To enjoy him forever. The, the, the men that wrote that were, were coming to all these passages, all these passages where God says to give them praise constantly. I know that many of you are going through, I know what many of you are going through. I've been there myself in both recent times and in years past. And I'm here to tell you that you must look up. You have to look up and drink the water of life that Christ offers, that the Holy Spirit is there giving you since he shows you grace and mercy. Isaiah wants the people to remember who they are in God, not to, not to have a pity party about why things are happening the way they are why they're being punished, why they're being conquered. But he wants them to remember what Peter says many centuries later, what, 450 or so centuries later, or 750 or so centuries later, when he says in 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may what? Proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And then over in Isaiah 44, verse 6, 
we have these words again. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Beside me there is no God. There isn't any God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Hear those words, fear not, nor be afraid. I, have I not told you from old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? And he's talking to the Israelites who were looking all around them at the world and wanted too often what the world wanted and not what God wanted. 